So Daniel and Kelly, thank you. Um, you're gonna give the microphone to our uh, fetal maternal doctor. She's going to educate us. And um, I'm so anxious to hear what they have to say. Thank you. All right, how are you guys doing? Okay, let me stick this back in here. I might actually hold it, river style. Um, thank you for having us and for being here. Uh, as she said, my name is Daniel Crawford. This is my beautiful wife, Kelly. And we are the co-founders of Able Speaks, which we're uh, eager to share a little bit more with you about as our time goes on today. We had the opportunity actually this past weekend to go to DC. Um, if you're familiar with the life movement and the pro-life conversation, there's a big gathering that happens every year uh, towards the end of January called the March for Life. And so uh, we got to participate in that, get to witness that and see what that was all about. And then while we were there, we attended uh, one of the many museums that are in DC kind of chronicling different periods of American history and world history. And so this particular museum that we explored, uh, it explored a 12, year, uh, a 12 year long period where a Western civilization and a government uh, regarded mentally and physically disabled persons as lives unworthy of living. Uh, disabled children were killed by lethal injection in the name of biological cleansing. Many physicians and doctors championed these theories that negated individual worth and dignity and the value of human life. For each vulnerable person at this time, it was up to somebody else whether you lived or whether you died, and there was really nothing that you could do about it if you were in the, that situation. And as you can imagine, children and infants were the most defenseless of all, with more than one million of them being killed during the reign of Adolf Hitler from 1933 to 1945. And so that's sobering and a heavy way to start. Uh, but one courageous German citizen said this, it was listed in the museum, it said, here we see the most frightful crime against human dignity, a crime that is unparalleled in the whole of history, a crime of this dimension has been perpetrated against human beings. Why did the German people behave so apathetically in the face of all of these abominable crimes, crimes so unworthy of the human race? Hardly anybody thinks about that. It is accepted as fact and placed out of mind. I was in June of 1942. And in 1973, just 28 years later, after the Holocaust ended, the Supreme Court of the United States of America determined that abortion would now become a constitutional right in our country. And for a frame of reference, in the Holocaust, six million innocent lives were taken. And in the past 47 years, there have been 60 million innocent lives taken. Um, we start there because the abortion industry combined with the introduction of peri prenatal genetic testing has created a culture where 90% of children conceived with a life-limiting diagnosis or disability will be terminated prior to birth. While I do believe that amounts to a modern-day holocaust of sorts, the difference is that I don't believe the hearts of these parents and doctors are filled with hatred or evil. I think their hearts have just been broken and their worlds turned completely upside down. One mother recorded these words. I was 16 weeks pregnant when my son received a life-limiting diagnosis. I remember being so afraid, afraid to lose him, afraid to love him, afraid of him. I cried thinking about all of my dreams slipping out of my hands. We don't want to shame families who have made a decision to terminate in the past, but we do want to strengthen families considering termination in the present and in the future after discovering their child's life may look different than they thought or imagined. So we've been invited here today to talk about how we can help families in this situation choose life and choose joy, even in the face of a difficult diagnosis and even in the face of loss. As we tackle this topic 
and as we speak from our own personal experience, we hope to accomplish really three main things over the next 30 to 40 minutes. And we hope to be able to provide you with awareness, to provide you with some vision, and then finally, to provide you with an invitation. And we'll also have time for Q&A at the end. And so if you have questions that come up throughout the next half hour, you can jot those down. And we would love to take those questions at the end. And as you'll see, we feel passionately about this topic because we've lived it. And uh, we are honored to be here to share a little bit about our experience with you today. But before we tell you anything, really, we would love to show you something first. And so um, a moment ago, Kelly quoted... Uh, a pregnant mother in the midst of her despair processing that news. Uh, but that quote was incomplete. And so we'd like for you to watch the rest of her story as well as a piece of our own with this short video. To us, those stories paint a picture of what could be. And the reality is that very few families today in our situation are, are having that experience that you saw in that video. That's the sad reality. And it's for one of two reasons. The, the first reason that that experience is, is really rare is what we shared earlier, that roughly 90% of families who discover the life-limiting diagnosis during pregnancy will choose to abort that child. And so really only one out of 10 Abels um, gets a run at this thing. As a quick note on that, uh, this was helpful for me when I heard it. We recognize that scenarios, uh, our scenario is one that is often brought forth from the pro-choice community. Of the, he, clearly, this is a situation where uh, you know an exception of, of abortion should be allowed for these situations, even up to the point of birth in many states. And uh, no one should be forced to embrace and endure, and navigate and walk through that journey is the logic behind that. And so um, the particular tragedy in that is that uh, aside from what we know from God's word and all of the other things, if you're a follower of Christ, is that just secular statistics and studies and research, uh, specifically a study from Duke University in 2015, discovered that women who choose to abort the child with a life-limiting diagnosis actually experience significantly more despair, more depression, more post-traumatic stress than the women who choose to carry that child to term. In other words, psychologically and emotionally, abortion is not sparing these families from suffering. It is compounding it. However, that's not to say that choosing to carry and navigate that journey is an easy road to walk. Yeah, so um, that's the first point. And um, the second reason why very few families have that experience that you saw in that video um, is because for the 10% that do choose to carry, there's a devastating lack of medical, informational, emotional, spiritual support available to them. For us personally, um, these are just a few of the obstacles we faced while carrying Abel um, and during our time in the hospital with him. Um, first of all, we were only given the option to terminate. The exact language was, you can schedule an appointment and try again for a better one. As we sought more clarity, we discovered that our provider did not really know how the genetic blood test worked or how accurate it was. Um, we were just told to call the company that makes and distributes the test. The only thing we were repeatedly told about the diagnosis was that it is considered to be incompatible with life. We weren't given any further information on children living with trisomy 18 or count counseled on how to care for a child with disabilities if Abel did live. This left us to do our own research and find our own support system in that season. Prior to Abel's birth, we were clear with our providers that we wanted to give him oxygen if he needed it. That did not happen until Daniel saw him struggling to breathe after birth and demanded that oxygen be given, to which they were responding, are you sure that that's what you want to do? We were not given any information on how to feed Abel, and when we asked questions, it was recommended to simply give him sugar water just to make him comfortable. It became apparent that nobody expected our son to live and had not prepared to care for him if he did. I wish these things were rare and unique to us, but sadly, these challenges are the norm. 
As another example, the hospital situation that Cooper mentioned um, in that video was on day two of Ellis's life when their hospital placed a DNR order or a do not resuscitate order in Ellis's chart without asking his parents. It took them almost a week to remove it as Ellis's life hung in the balance. And only after that, the hospital discovered that it was now at that time against Texas law um, to place a DNR in a child's chart without a parental consent. Um, prior to that, it was legal to do that. So um, another example of this is that I served a family with trisomy 18 here in Dallas and um, they were outright denied prenatal care after their diagnosis. No sonograms, no equipping, no nothing. And then their son Gabriel was born, completely healthy. I was in the room when he was born and the nurse looked at me and said, do you think he has trisomy 18? It was clear that they had never seen a child with trisomy 18 make it to birth and didn't even know what they might look like. More than anything, it's a humbling reminder to us that God alone is the author of every life. While doctors do the best they can with the tools they have, they are not God. And so these are just examples of the kind of gaps that we hope to be able to fill in by educating and supporting and equipping families in this situation. Because as you saw in that video, it doesn't have to be this way. We believe and we have seen parents choose life choose to cherish their child's life regardless of the outlook. They have experienced joy and hope even in the midst of sorrow. They're able to look back on their journey with no regrets. We desire to create unity and mutual understanding between doctors and patients in the midst of these emotionally difficult, medically complex cases. And we desire to build relationships where doctors are not viewed as villains but held up as heroes. So thankfully, this is not a pipe dream. Thankfully, there are some incredible medical providers out there. The trajectory of our journey with Abel completely changed the moment that we were introduced to Dr. Kevin McGee. He valued Abel's life. He's one of our heroes. And it's fun for us today to be able to introduce to you another one of our heroes on the medical front lines, loving parents, loving children, uh, our friend, Dr. Ashley Zink. Give her a hand. I'm certainly happy to be here to talk to you guys today. Um, it was um, several years into my career that through church I became aware of the Crawfords and the story of their son. And it brought me so much joy to see that they were able to put their story out um, that I, I contacted them and, you know, kind of tried to reach out and, and see how we could perhaps um, bring that information to physicians and whatnot. So just by matter of introduction, um, you know, everyone knows what a cardiologist does. Everyone knows a what a pediatrician does. Um, I have a fairly niche specialty. So I'm a maternal fetal medicine specialist. Some people call it perinatology. But essentially, I did a residency in ob -GYN, and then I did subsequent three-year fellowship in maternal fetal medicine, which involves um, training in ultrasound, genetics, as well as maternal um, complications that can, you know, make pregnancies um, less than routine. So what is a life-limiting diagnosis? So in a way, we all have one. Like, we are alive, <laughs> and our life will end. <laughs> but typically, when you're pregnant, you assume that that baby will live longer than you do. Um, most people, when they become pregnant, automatically go to, oh, I'm taking this baby home. And the reality is, I sit next to multiple women every day who have seen recurrent pregnancy loss or who have gone through a pregnancy where they unfortunately now know about these different things. But I want you to guys to all know about them too so that you're aware, so that if you encounter people, you'll be able to, um, to sort of have an understanding of what they're going through. So um, there are chromosomal issues that can result in pregnancies, most likely not um, resulting in a child that'll live as long as expected. So um, brief, 
brief genetics lesson. So chromosomes, um, or bodies that stain, that's essentially what that means if you're going back to Greek or Latin, because they plate them out as a karyotype. Um, if you think of them as a map of the United States, and if you pretend that the map of the United States only includes 46 states. So you got 23, let's say, from England, and you got 23, let's say, from Spain. And so that's how many a typical person has. That's how many we assume that we all have. That's not necessarily the case, but that's what we assume. Trisomy means you got an extra state. So um, instead of there being one Kentucky, there's two. Or instead of there being one California, there are two, or well, three total. So you got an extra one, oftentimes from the mom, not necessarily. There can be other reasons why um, you would inherit an extra whole chromosome or an extra piece of a chromosome. The most common ones are the ones that sort of reach a threshold where we would say, hey, let's screen for these, because these can change what we expect of this pregnancy or you know, change what we expect from the anatomy or physiology of this fetus would be trisomies of 13, 18, and then 21. You guys pretty much know 21 is Down syndrome. Um, Down syndrome, typically not considered to be a life-limiting diagnosis, but depending on what medical conditions accompany that, it really could be um, included in that as well. But trisomy 13 and 18 from sort of the early years of my genetics training, I was taught were lethal. But then you come across fetuses that don't seem to have a physical condition where you can really put a finger on why or when you think that that child may pass away. Um, and they're difficult. You would think that we would know the answers to these questions because we have all this technology and we have all this information. Each and every cell within their body has an extra set of chromosomes, so it just doesn't function quite the way that ours does. They don't fight infection per se the same way, or their heart muscle may not work the same way. Um, and a lot of times it results in actual physical or structural abnormalities where you can say, hey, this, you know, if not corrected, will lead to not being able to survive for a very long time. So those are um, conditions of such. There's another condition where you get an entire half set of extra chromosomes. It's called a partial molar triploidy. Um, there can also be structural issues that happen. Nothing is atypical about the chromosomes, but just structurally, things did not form in the way that we consider to be typical. So functionally, things don't work in the way that we expect. So that could be anything that re results in you not having two functioning kidneys. You are fine with one functioning kidney, but if you have no functioning kidneys, that does not result in the ability to um, survive long-term outside of the uterus once you have to start breathing and oxygenating on your own. Um, other things that can be um, abnormalities of the nervous system, so not having a skull or missing the um, top portion of your brain, so anencephaly or acrania, um, those also are considered life-limiting diagnoses. But a couple years into my training, I really started realizing, like, why are we calling these lethal? Like, we should just call these life-limiting because I just report the news. I don't make the news. I don't know when this child will take its last breath. I know there's an increased risk of stillbirth. I know I want to support this family as they're going through because they may not have pictures of their child at five years old, but I'll give them as many pictures as they can of their baby when it's, you know, 28 weeks in utero because that may, be, that may be all they have. We know there's an increased risk for stillbirth. There's an increased risk for passing away during delivery. There's an increased risk for maybe not making it outside the hospital, but we don't know. And I think these are important things that we as physicians um, communicate to our patients. Um, sometimes you can have a sense, and I really try to help people have a sense. You know, it's a big difference to know, hey, may I potentially go home with this child with um, you know, perinatal palliative care assistance, or does this appear to be something where most likely we're not going to be able to leave the hospital? That can be helpful for people. So our goals really are to sit with families, explain things to them well so they really understand what's going on with their child, help them sort of understand what we think is going to happen, and then just really walk with them through that process. Um, I, the Crawfords are not alone in this, and you saw the other two families as well. I've seen it repetitively. These women are not more sad because they held their baby and then lost their baby. They have that experience. They're able to grieve with other people. Their child has a name. Their child has a birth certificate. Their child was known by their friends and their family and can be remembered. The families I've had that have, and it's vastly out of, out of fear. These are not unwanted pregnancies. These are just unplanned in the way they manifest. And so just the immediate reaction of like, oh my goodness, I don't, like, this is going to be so sad and my child's going to suffer. 
and so they proceed with termination. I have seen women really struggle with that decision. I think one of the biggest issues, even if we do diagnostic testing, you know, we can say, okay, for sure your child has trisomy 18. What if they don't really believe that? What if years from now they're like, what if they were wrong? You know, I just went and terminated. What if it wasn't correct? Or I don't know what could have happened. When you see things through to their end, you know what could have happened because you waited for it and you let it play out in front of you. And you let others in on your journey. And I think that is a huge um, comfort to people in the midst of grief. It doesn't make it unsad um, just because you got it over with quickly. Um, and I think that's something that I really try to convey to people because it seems so easy. Like, let me just, let me just make this go away. You're not going to make it go away. This has happened, and now we have to figure out how are you going to feel the best about this situation five or ten years from now. Um, some areas that I really have identified as being um, spaces where we can really go out and improve this. So each and every one of you, you can take the brochure that you get today talking about Able Speaks, and you can take it to your OBGYN. You can really help spread the awareness that this is a thing. Like perinatal palliative care is absolutely um, in existence, and hospitals are doing better jobs. Um, you know, we've got cuddle cots and other types of things for people who lose their children via stillbirth, um, but we also have avenues for helping people spend the most quality time with their child that they're able to have. Um, the other thing is, um, you know, helping individualize things, help people understand, you know, what was important to you? What is, what do you most want to accomplish? Do you want a live birth, you know, at any cost? Like, do you want a C-section if we think that your child is not, you know, is starting to not do well, not have normal fluid, et cetera? Or do you feel more comfortable just letting things, having routine care, and if you have a stillbirth, feeling the comfort of knowing that that, you know, was the end um, that was meant? And everybody's different as far as, you know, kind of what feels the most comfortable to them and how they feel like God really has, um, you know, led them to, to care and steward the life of their child for the duration that they have. Um, other avenues that I really think are important to think of when we're thinking about advocating with um, you know, lawmakers or whatnot, burial and final expenses can be expensive. And so in my regular job, I deal with people who are typically very well resourced in sort of the Plano Frisco area, but I also take care of women at Parkland on Thursday afternoons, and they have very different levels of resources. And so there are women who literally choose termination out of practical matters of, hey, that's pretty inexpensive, or you know, having an induction in the hospital can be covered under routine prenatal care. Burial and other expenses perhaps can be more daunting to them. So if there's ways that you guys can think of um, for you know, improving those situations for people, that can be um, really beneficial. So um, I'll be available for any questions at the end if you'll have any, any further questions. Um, yeah, so I think after hearing what Ashley had to say, um, be encouraged because joy and hope can and do coexist with sorrow. Be encouraged because there are parents choosing life and choosing love even in the face of loss or disability. Be encouraged because in all of that, God is in the business of writing stories of redemption. On that note, I wanted to share quickly that today is a meaningful day for us. Abel was originally due exactly four years ago today on January 29th, 2016. Abel was born on January 22nd instead, the day Roe v. Wade was passed 43 years before. Our daughter Mayfield was born a year later on January 22nd, 2017. <laughs> Abel Speaks was born on January 22nd, 2018. And on Jan January 22nd, 2019, we had another son, Deacon Abel Crawford. <laughs> yeah, so I don't know what the Lord's doing with that, but here we are. Um, you heard Jordan Bailey in the video say, I can remember the first time I saw a picture of Abel. I can still so clearly remember that moment. Seeing his face changed my perspective. It was the first time I wasn't afraid of Ellis. 
God used his story to give me hope and finally a breath of air. I wasn't afraid, I was hopeful. We knew our baby boy was being knit together perfectly by his creator for a purpose. Authentic, personal stories have the power to change people's minds because they have the power to change people's hearts. For parents and providers alike, stories have the power to humbly offer a new and different perspective. We've watched dozens of families told to abort, choose not to, after reading or hearing someone's story and seeing that they can do this and they don't have to do it alone. Over the past few years, God has used Able Speaks to care for 70 families. That's 70 children created by God and cherished by their parents. 70 unique stories that we've had the privilege of playing a small role in. Not only throughout DFW Metroplex, but in San Antonio, Houston, and Austin, as well as North Carolina, Oklahoma, Georgia, Illinois, California, New Mexico, New Jersey, Kentucky, West Virginia, Arkansas, Connecticut, Pennsylvania, Colorado, Mexico, Canada, Ireland, the UK, and Australia. I Skyped with our pregnant mama in Australia carrying a child with trisomy 18 not too long ago because she found Ellis's story online and reached out to Jordan, his mama, who ministered to her and then connected her with Abel Speaks. The ripples continue to go forth. Here's a photo of her with her son, Teddy, on the other side of the world. And so in conclusion, before we wrap up, um, as we share stories like the ones that you saw and see parents choosing life, cherishing their children, we pray that we might humbly just offer a different perspective and help start to write a new narrative. And we pray that the services that we do feel called to provide will continue to help families cherish their child's life and have hope in the midst of sorrow. Uh, you caught a glimpse of what some of our mission looks like in action from that video. Uh, to learn more about how we support our families, you can go to ablespeaks.org uh, is our hub and our home base. And as far as other things that you could do to be a part of this mission with us, uh, I'd love to boldly ask you to consider the following. And this is laid out on cards right outside of that door if you want to grab one. But number one, just uh, will you consider being an ambassador and an advocate for Able Speaks? It's not an official title, but just will you function as someone who is going to help raise awareness of what you heard today? someone uh, who might personally share what you heard or someone who might even invite us in some other capacities to share what you've heard, uh, whether it's a larger speaking engagement like this or uh, a smaller home gathering. It's always a joy and a blessing for us to get to share. And so if that's something that comes to mind, you can reach out to us, support at ablespeaks.org is where all of our email gets pushed. So support at ablespeaks.org. And then number two, uh, will you be a connector? Will you consider the people in your spheres of influence when we leave here who might have a heart for our vision or who might even have a specific skill set that overlaps with our vision? It could be a medical provider, a doula, a counselor, a pastor, a photographer, uh, and so on. Or it could simply just be someone who's really passionate about the life conversation and who couldn't make it today. Uh, but you know they would be excited and encouraged and want to get involved with what we're doing. We'd love to make those connections. Support at ablespeaks.org. And if you forget all that, just ablespeaks.org. That's where you can find us. Uh, being in Washington, D.C. at the March for Life uh, this past weekend was profound as we witnessed tens of thousands of people rally around a common cause. However, I would say that the mission of Able Speaks and I hope the mission of every other pro-life organization, it does not hinge, it will not be altered, it will not be diminished, even if Roe v. Wade is overturned. If and when that day comes, and we are praying that it will, and we believe that it will, the reality is that that day will only produce more families who receive these diagnoses and are left searching for support and searching for resources. And so we're looking beyond any piece of legislation and we are embracing what Matthew 9 says, that the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers 
are few. Therefore, pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. So to close with just a couple of quotes, uh, these are from the last three or four days, I think, three or four days. This one uh, says, one of my friends from church just sent me a link to your website. I feel like I finally found some people who have walked the path that my family is walking right now. I live in the UK and I'm 25 weeks pregnant with a little girl diagnosed with trisomy 18 when I was 14 weeks pregnant. I was offered an abortion but declined as my husband and I want to carry this baby, love her, and look after her until Jesus takes her to heaven. I have not found any organizations which offer support to parents in our situation in the UK. Are you able to help us at all even though we do not live in the US? And our prayer and our goal and our plan is to say yes, absolutely. This was another quote uh, just yesterday from one of the mamas we've been walking with for several months uh, who was going in to have her baby. She said, you guys, I cannot begin to tell you how grateful I am for your love, prayer, and friendship. I feel very strongly that God gave me you guys for such a time as this. To feel as isolated as I have at times, he has used Able Speaks to consistently minister to me. Y'all, put some skin on it for me. And I just love God and love y'all so much for that. I have to say, as scared as I have been, I am not feeling that as much as I am excitement to meet Noah. Still some nerves, but the normal kind at the moment. I thank y'all so much for covering us in prayer. I will keep you updated and send a pic once he's here. So she followed up on that, followed through, I should say, and at 3 p.m., uh, her chubby little man <laughs> with T18 made his debut. And so we leave you guys with an invitation, uh, which is to say, will you join us? Will you pray with us? Uh, will you labor with us in the harvest? I uh, quit my job three months ago, and the Crawfords are all in. And uh, we also believe, as Jacqueline said in that quote, that, that God has called us for such a time as this. And so this is just saying, here we are, and use us. And yet we know we can't do this alone. We don't desire to do this alone. And so uh, we invite you to join us. Thank you to Council for Life for hosting us today. Thank you for being here and joining us and listening today. And we'd love to open ourselves up. We'd love to invite Dr. Zink back up as well and open up to any and all questions you have. There's no off limits questions. Um, we talk about this stuff a lot. You're not gonna offend us or hurt our feelings. Um, appreciate the sensitivity, but uh, you can really feel free to, to fire away if you do have any questions. Thank you. So he was asking about the child who was diagnosed trisomy 18, but then born healthy. In um, I'll share and then I'll, I'll let her share. Um, just surrounding the specific situation. Um, yeah, so we had a family reach out and said, hey, we did the genetic testing, um, which is just a blood test to determine um, likelihood of um, having certain abnormalities. Um, I let Dr. Zink talk through that a little bit more. But um, the test is not 100% accurate, but this family was told that it was. And at that point, the provider said the baby's gonna pass away in utero pretty quickly. There's no need to continue prenatal care. Um, when the baby passes, you can come into the hospital and, and we'll deliver him. Um, he did not pass away in utero, so they went in when she went into labor and um, I was in the hospital room with them and um, he ended up being born perfectly healthy. Um, so partly, some providers um, sometimes don't want to continue, they think it's considered futile to continue um, spending the time and money and effort to do sonograms and things like that because the child is gonna, from their vantage point, pass away. Um, and so they don't find it worthwhile, I guess. Um, that's not all providers, this, I mean some, but in these circumstances, we do find families 
Um, often, once a diagnosis is given, the prenatal care is um, less than ideal, depending on the provider's worldview and perspective. Um, so that's kind of a little bit about that piece. I don't know if you have anything else to add. So I think this is actually what I spend a lot of my time with families as they come into my office and interested in screening, is explaining to them, what is screening? What is a diagnostic test? So screening, the particular test that this person probably had is a blood test. And it basically takes advantage of some technology that allows um, the lab to distinguish between a maternal tri or a maternal 13th chromosome, 18th chromosome, 21st chromosome, and a fetal, although technically it's the placenta, which I think is a huge, important differential. There's cells that slough off the placenta and go into the maternal circulation, and they can be identified as non-maternal and essentially, I, th I kind of explained to it as stacking things up. So mom, we assume, has two copies of all the different chromosomes. Um, and so you expect that the fetal sample is going to have the same amount. And if so, it's a low-risk screen. Um, it actually gets reported out as negative. I call it low risk because nothing's ever negative till it's diagnostic. Um, or if there is too much, then it's considered an increased risk screen. So there's multiple reasons this can be the case. Um, a lot of people actually will do this test because they want to find out the sex of their baby. Um, but for example, there are women walking around who carry a male chromosome. Their screen would say that their baby had a Y chromosome, but it wasn't their baby, it's them. Um, there is such a thing as placental mosaicism, and actually the 13th and 18th chromosomes are more likely to be involved in that. Um, and when I think about what happened to that family, it's actually very appalling from a medical standpoint because if it's confined placental mosaicism, there's actually a huge risk for growth restriction because the placenta may not work well. But when the two cells initially join up, the egg and the sperm, Oddly enough, sometimes as the embryo is developing, the cells that have the atypical number of chromosomes get kind of pushed over to the and become the placenta as development continues, and the fetus itself may not have an atypical number of chromosomes. The other thing is you can have partial trisomies. I actually have a cousin who has tri partial trisomy 13. That's extremely, like she would not be her age if she had full trisomy 13, but it's partial. So her screen in utero 45 years ago, um, would have been positive as well if that had existed. So it is paramount, and I think the companies that market these tests kind of take advantage of the fact that doctors have been out of training for a while. They're not receiving continuing education on sort of how these work, et cetera. And so I feel like there is a lot of education of, yeah, it may be right. And there are times when we get a screen like that and I look with the ultrasound and the ultrasound findings in and of themselves would have led me to have a concern for, you know, whatever the, um, the screen positive result is but sometimes not. And I've had false positives of every single thing that those screens screen for. And so that's, it's actually just, it breaks my doctor heart when, yeah. when I hear that. Um, Cause you know, sometimes even if you're not doing heroic life-saving things, you never withdraw care. I mean, you always care. Nothing's ever futile. That's good. That's good. Yes. Pro life, right there. Yeah. Thank you for sharing that. Thank you. And there are we're in touch with families across the country uh, who have not just living children. I mean, they're three and four and ten and eleven, and um, it's not always um, fatal. That wasn't me. <laughs> yeah, she said, uh, what are we doing to educate OBGYNs about this? If they find us, we can inform them. But uh, for Dr. Zink, she can speak to that. There was one opportunity that we got to join her for that's exactly the type of initiative. Um, but take it away. 
I, I don't think, well, I think that's still very much the, the dominant theme is that, um, you know, in a culture where everyone's kind of looking for perfection and optimization, um, you know, sort of sub-perfection, sub-optimization in the eyes of whoever um, is still considered, you know, futile or, um, you know, there are oftentimes significant um, health conditions that go along with this, but you can't say when it's lethal. But I think that's, that, is, that is the narrative. Um, essentially, and I think that that probably is still is still the case. So um, I gave grand rounds um, at UT Southwestern to their department of OBGYN back in was it August something like that, um, and I just thought it would be you know helpful because you know as you come out and you start practicing and you see people and you see kind of the end and you get to sit right next to someone which residents don't have that benefit they see one person one week and they may never see that person again so they don't have that opportunity so I've tried to kind of garner from my experience in the community coming back and saying hey let me put you further ahead than I was when I came out let me kind of give you an idea of what it looks like to to take care of people and really you know see what's going on with their family on Facebook you know five years later uh, for some really significant medical um, diagnoses and I think it's stories. It really it, stories are what sort of you know push the push the envelope, um, and not not super you know exciting narrative you know not really likely situations. This is this is normal. This is not um, a one off type situation. Um, I had a family bring back their six month old recently, and she's you know she's still alive with no sort of obvious reason why she's not going to be next month. So, um. Go ahead. Oh, um, I was just going to say on that point, uh, kind of like Daniel mentioned earlier, um, we love connecting with medical providers because like Ashley said, um, getting to share our story, a lot of times they might, our OB, we were the second family in 20 years that she had ever had choose to continue a pregnancy with a life limiting diagnosis. And so it's not for a, lack of wanting to care for families in our situation. There's just not a lot of experience. And so to be able to share our story and just say, hey, you know, it's the hardest road we've ever rocked, but it's also um, was one of the most joyful seasons of our life too, in a lot of ways. And so to be able to share that, I think with providers really does change their heart and their perspective on families um, who do choose to continue the pregnancy. We, yes, I <laughs> love that. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. I actually have a two-part question based on health awareness and education, which is kind of what we're talking about in general. My first part question would be, in the context of educating, yes, the medical community, but us as a grassroots community, beyond environments such as this, do you offer either, either of you as a medical uh, experience of awareness and education? or a grassroots family education where you're educating people on the story that you're talking about and specifically about the screening, how to understand that. So education from a grassroots perspective is my first question. And the second part to that would be, I'm curious about the um, inheritance of once someone is diagnosed with this genetic awareness, what are the odds of a second or a third pregnancy? Obviously, you have success and you have beautiful, healthy children, but what are the successes or the awareness of this happening more than once in a family? That's an easy question, so I'll just do that one really quick. So the quoted rate is 1%. Once you've had a child with a chromosomal aneuploidy, the recurrence rate is listed as 1% until your age-related risk exceeds that, and so that's gonna be when you're about 40. Um, there are conditions that make it more likely if mom or dad has a balanced translocation, such that they have all the chromosomes they're supposed to have, there's nothing missing, there's nothing extra, but there is a rearrangement, then when it meets up with their you know, spouse's um, gamete, then there's an increased chance for that happening more so than there would be at background risk, but in general, low. Okay, we're going to take one more question, if that's okay. All right, this gentleman has his hand up. <laughs> Hi, Jansen. to take to um, the doctor when we were meeting with the NICU specialist. And that's a provider that you don't think about, but um, when we're gonna be at um, 
Presby off Walnut Hill. And so we met with the NICU doctor, and what they told us was, and luckily they prepared us to ask these questions. By the way, Dr. Zink uh, uh, helped our, with our twins that are three. Um, but uh, they, they, they basically said, look, if you want comfort care and you want to be in this room, your wife Amy can be with them after the C-section and, or, with Josiah and hold him. Now NICU, she's got to be released from her doctor to come to the NICU. Um, NICU, you can have oxygen and a feeding tube, but if you want comfort care, you can't have oxygen or a feeding tube. Our nurses aren't trained and there's liability there. So we're dealing with that right now. We would have never known to ask those questions. Um, so thank you. Gonna wrap up, or you're gonna wrap up? Sorry. Um, yeah, I mean, to answer your question, part A. You know, there's there's not really a systematized. How are we educating the public on this yet? Our plan right now is let's take advantage of any and all opportunities like this one and just start telling our story and telling people what we're doing, uh, inviting other folks in for wisdom, for connections, for anything. Uh, to build this thing with us and dream big about what this could look like in five years and 10 years and 20 years. And uh, as I said, we're all in. Bless you guys for being here and lending us your ears. And uh, we hope to, to know you. If we don't yet, we'll be hanging up here for a little while. And so i um, happy to answer any further questions today. or happy to get in touch with you online as we've talked about. And so I'll let you wrap up, Rivers. Thanks. Wow. Let's give them a nut. Let's stand for them because they are our heroes. Three heroes. Thank you. Yeah.